This week, I'm venturing into Shakespeare country with a visit to a town I worked in for 20 years, but never really looked at with my paranormal eye engaged before now. It is an area settled since Roman times and has seen fire, plague and fighting, as well as the birth of a famous playwright. And it turns out that the ghosts that haunt here are an unquiet lot, making themselves known in houses, churches, museums and even the theatre. So let's pull on our best tights, button our doublets, sharpen our quills and set forth to meet the spectres of Stratford-upon-Avon. There are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy could describe the mysteries of Clopton House, a 17th century building on a site where a manor house has stood since it was granted to the Clopton family in the 13th century. Converted into flats in 1982, it is not a property I can freely explore, though the exterior is accessible and impressive. It is also reputed to be haunted by no fewer than four ghosts. The first is a priest, said to be the victim of a murder in the property's secret chapel. People have seen his misty figure on the stairs and wandering the corridors, following the route along which someone dragged his murdered body. An uncleanable bloodstain, out damn spot, has also been linked to this particular spirit. I wonder if the stain is still there and if this troubled priest still follows this course, passing through new walls erected when the manor was converted as he retraces his tragic final steps. The three other ghosts are all female and are believed to be members of the Clopton family. People say that Margaret, or Margareta Clopton, drowned herself in a well at the back of the premises in the 1560s. Her reason for ending her life in this way was either rejection by the man she loved or her father's opposition to her chosen swain. Either way, her unhappy spirit remains tied to Clopton House, appearing by the well and in her old bedroom. Some say her death inspired Shakespeare when he wrote Ophelia's tragic end, and that's not an entirely far-fetched notion. Shakespeare was a friend of the Clopton family, and in 1597, he lived in one of their other properties in the town. It is believable that he was aware of the story of Maggie's Well at the time he was writing Hamlet. A generation later, Alice Clopton was abducted from the house on the eve of her wedding. Pursued by would-be rescuers and realizing that he wouldn't be able to outrun them, her kidnapper threw Alice from the back of his horse off a bridge and into a river where she drowned. A senseless, heartbreaking crime, and another sorrowful spirit who seems unable to move on. But it is the story of Charlotte Clopton that is most disturbing. Charlotte died during one of the plague years, possibly 1564, when Stratford-upon-Avon lost approximately one-seventh of its population. The writer Elizabeth Gaskell, who visited Clopton House in the 1820s, told Charlotte's story in a piece published by William Howitt in 1840. She says that the dead girl was buried with fearful haste in the vaults of Clopton Chapel, attached to Stratford Church, but the sickness was not stayed. In a few days, another of the Cloptons died, and him they bore to the ancestral vault but as they descended the gloomy stairs, they saw by the torchlight Charlotte Clopton in her grave clothes, leaning against the wall. And when they looked nearer, she was indeed dead, but not before, in the agonies of despair and hunger, she had bitten a piece from her white, round shoulder. 
Yes, Charlotte Clopton was buried alive. Her ghost has been seen at Clopton House, often in her bedroom, which was reported to have a close, pent-up atmosphere, giving visitors an eerie feeling. Small wonder that there should be such an oppressive aura there, in the place poor Charlotte returned to after her dreadful death, alone and trapped and terrified. Maybe she gets some comfort from being back in her childhood home, even if she hasn't yet found peace. Clopton House also has a connection to the infamous gunpowder plot. One of the conspirators, Ambrose Rookwood, rented the property in 1605. Rookwood was one of the unfortunate plotters who met his end on the scaffold, hanged, drawn and quartered. And the king felt this was the kindest punishment. The horrifying things we do to each other in the name of justice and religion will never cease to amaze me. Good friend, for Jesus' sake forbear to dig the dust enclosed here. Blessed be the man that spares these stones, and cursed be he that moves my bones. These are the words on Shakespeare's grave in Holy Trinity, the church in Stratford-upon-Avon where he was both baptised and buried. A curse from beyond the grave that will fall on anyone who takes his bones out of their final resting place. This was a real risk at the time. It wasn't uncommon for remains to be dug up to make room for more burials. Charnel rooms or crypts stored these bones, often by type rather than by person. Imagine it. Long, dark corridors lined with shelves of skulls or piles of pelvises. Clearly, Shakespeare was someone who didn't like the thought of his mortal remains spending eternity like a jumbled up jigsaw puzzle or, worse, ground into fertiliser. Apparently, applications have been made to access Shakespeare's grave, but these are always turned down. Is the reason fear of the curse, or just a healthy respect for the dead? It isn't logical, but I think there's something incredibly forceful about the notion of a curse of words used to inflict pain and torment from the other side. I'm more than happy to leave the great playwright in peace and not put the hexing power of his words to the test. Hell is empty and all the devils are here, said Shakespeare in The Tempest. He might as well have been talking about one of the oldest properties in Stratford-upon-Avon. Shreve's House and Barn at 40 Sheep Street is a medieval building currently used as a museum. It is also famous for its hauntings, with a ghost for nearly every room. There has been a property at 40 Sheep Street since 1196, though records about it only exist from about 1566 onwards. It suffered significant damage from a terrible fire that swept through the town in 1595, and further harm from smaller fires in 1614 and 1619. It has been a home, an inn, a billet for parliamentary soldiers and a museum, and the spirits who remain are not happy simply to be seen. There is a hostility to the hauntings here. Visitors have reported a range of alarming sensations. Dizzy spells, sudden sickness and a crushing breathlessness. Even the bravest start to feel weak and shaken. Cold, sharp chills cut through the air without warning and invisible fingers seem to pull and prod unsuspecting guests. In certain rooms, a freezing mist drifts in and out and the air is sometimes heavy with the disturbing smells of burning or even rotting flesh. Unpredictable flashes of light have startled many, 
while pictures on the walls sway as though moved by unseen hands. In one chilling instance, a woman was struck by an object that seemed to come from nowhere. But perhaps most unnerving of all are the figures. At the top of the stairs stands the grim apparition of a man clutching an axe, his expression fierce and unyielding, while an old woman, weighed down with age, struggles up the steps beside him. A shadowy Civil War soldier is glimpsed, emerging from the darkness. Now and then, a young girl appears. Said to be the ghost of a pickpocket, her faint figure dissolves slowly into nothing. On other occasions, a silent, dark, hooded figure with glowing red eyes emerges. It stands there, watching, exuding an oppressive air of terrifying menace. In 2004, the Most Haunted team filmed an episode of their show at Shreve's house. During recording, Derek Cora claimed to be possessed by a gruesome experience of consummation and torture, causing him to collapse. Now, given that colleagues proved this particular spiritual medium was a liar and a fake, we should take his experience with a healthy pinch of salt. So many other people have experienced paranormal phenomena in this place, though, that I'm not going to dismiss it all. I've only ever walked past this building, stopping sometimes to admire the 16th century cobblestone alleyway and timbered walls. And thinking about it, I'm not at all sure I would want to visit after dark. There are some unhappy and unsettled energies lingering here, disturbing entities that refuse to rest. Perhaps we should heed their warnings and leave them alone. Thy bones are marrowless, thy blood is cold, said Macbeth to Banquo's ghost. And whilst those words will have been quoted on stage at the Royal Shakespeare Company's theatres many times over the years, I wonder if they've ever been directed at any of the ghosts who haunt these locations. Because the RST and the Swan hold a long, eerie history of ghostly sightings and encounters, reported by both staff and visitors. Among the most well-known of these spectral presences is the perfumed lady. Her scent, a heavy old-fashioned floral fragrance, drifts through the upper circle at the RST. The unmistakable perfume seems to appear most often when new front-of-house staff begin their first shifts. It is as though this unseen visitor is watching and welcoming them in her own mysterious way. Another spectre, known as the Grey Lady, reportedly haunts the Swan Theatre. Each night, security guards turn off the lights, but by the time they return to the stage door, the lights are on again without explanation. Despite numerous checks, they found no timer, no wiring fault, and no tampering with the switch itself. The phenomenon is persistent, Regardless of who turns off the lights or how many times, they always find a way back on. It is the spirit of the Grey Lady who is thought to be responsible. Witnesses say she appears so lifelike that she is sometimes mistaken for a confused theatre-goer who has lost her way, and she has even been caught on CCTV. The costume workshop, an old warren of rickety stairs, creaking floorboards and shadowy corners has its own ghost. Sometimes seen as a faint figure at the bottom of the fire escape, staff also report hearing footsteps on the upper floors when no one is there, and reportedly don't like being in the workshop alone late at night. Other spirits may have been disturbed during the major rebuilding work carried out at the RST, which completed in 2010. According to one report, workers on site would often see people who shouldn't or couldn't be where they saw them. And there's a presence at one of the stage doors who is generally genial, 
but can press against the panelling if he doesn't want to let you through. It seems ghosts can be as temperamental as the living when they want to be. Thou know'st his common, all that lives must die, passing through nature to eternity. These words from Hamlet echo in my mind as I finish my eerie trip through Stratford-upon-Avon. Looking out not through the eyes of a busy commuter, but with a new stillness, it seems this town is as alive with spirits as it is with history. From the haunted whispers of Clopton House to the unsettling chill in Forty Sheep Street, these lingering presences, caught between the realms of the past and present, remind me that every stone and timber here holds memories, and maybe even warnings. These shadowy souls are watching still, reaching out in flickers of light, cold shivers and sudden scents that hover in the air. Some waiting patiently in the quiet halls of theatres and the shadows of ancient homes. Others marking the presence of any intruder who dares to disturb them. So if you find yourself walking the streets of Shakespeare's town after sunset, pause and listen carefully. You may just find that Stratford's ghosts are waiting to welcome you in the timeless, eerie silence of history. <laughs>